Okay, good. All right. Well, let me greet all of you this evening. Um, it is still 636 here in the U.S. We are one hour behind you. So it's just 636 here. It is 637 there in Trinidad. I want to greet all of you and wish all of you, I know this is the first time for the year, so I want to wish all of you the very best for 2024. I know we are in the third month. And um, I tell you, the year has just begun and we are already in the third month. Today is the 6th of March already. But I want to greet all of you this evening. And I want to introduce to you this evening where we're heading. We would be going into the last sessions we did, we were into the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, what we call, those are what we call the eschatological books or the prophetic books. We are now going to go into the largest portion of New Testament writing. We are going to study the books of the Apostle Paul, beginning with the book of Romans, the largest of his books. The, um, of the 27 books in the New Testament, they're written by the Apostle Paul. 27. And of the 27, he wrote about between 13 to 14 of those books. Some people have not attributed the book of um, Hebrews to him. Others have, I'm one of those meaning that it was, he's also the author of that book. Some believe it was one of Paul's students that wrote the book of um, Hebrews. Um, but nonetheless, what we have there, I would include him as the author because the Bible, the book of Hebrews is not very specific as to the author of the book. It's, you know, so um, I think that when you look at the writings of the book of Hebrews, though it is a bit different compared to the other writings of Paul, yet still it's rooted in the depth of theology, which is, in my view, Pauline. Okay? But we are going to begin the journey. And I want to say from the very on, let's have a word of prayer before we get into the ministry tonight. Father, we are not talking to the air. We are talking to you. And tonight we look into your face, into your beautiful, radiant, resurrected face. You have given us your son, even our Lord Jesus Christ. And we honor you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. We thank you for the blessed Holy Spirit whom you have given to us. Father, we commend into your hand the introduction tonight. And we pray that in this journey, lives will be transformed, beginning with your old servant, that we will not see the scholarship of a man, scholastic achievement of anyone. What we will see and hear is the amazing revelation that you gave to your servant, Paul the Apostle. He didn't get it because of years of study. He pulled himself away and went into the Arabian desert, away from everyone. And the word of God declares he was caught up to the third heaven where he was given the revelation of the writing. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher of the Bible. If you don't teach, you will never understand. At the very beginning, this 6th of March, 2024, I am asking that you would take the revelation that you have given to Paul. Lord, let it become a living reality in our hearts. Burn this truth into our spirit. We commend it now to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen 
and amen. Amen. I want to greet first and foremost God's servant, Pastor Stevens, and his precious wife, First Lady Carol Stevens. I want to greet all the members of our distinguished board and the global family directly and all those who will be joining in with us. We have Chrissy on, my daughter, with me. She's in Canada, Toronto. Crystal Ann. Hey, Crystal Ann also is on this evening. You know, Crystal Ann and her household. And um, everyone from the Global Encounter Ministry family. And my sister, June. I see June is now tuning up with us as well. So we are going on a pilgrimage on a journey, an odyssey in the writings of the greatest revelation of New Testament truth. For out of the 27 books, the Apostle Paul wrote virtually half of the New Testament. And it is not, and it is not by mere coincidence. It's by divine design. God selected a man that defied the very reason, human reasoning. How could you give to a man, an apostle born out of due season? He was not part of the original 12. He was given the distinguished, that distinction of being the persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ. He ran the church out of Jerusalem. And when he heard that they had migrated to Damascus, he decided that he was going to pursue them there, thereby receiving letters from that religious August body called the Sanhedrin, authorizing him to follow those, up, those disciples into Damascus and gave him the authority to arrest, imprison, beat, no doubt in the case of um, the first martyr, Stephen, who was stoned to death. And Paul held the clothes of the persecutors, inciting them to kill him. Could you imagine this is the man that God selected? and gave him the responsibility of almost virtually half of the New Testament to write. Not to Peter, not even John who laid his head on the breast of Jesus. You see? And so we must be very careful how we treat each other. Those who are least respected, it might have a janitor in the church. They treat everybody with honor because in the economy of God, God doesn't see people the way we see them. You see, we put people in high pedestal if they have accumulated wealth and money, if they were rich, if they came from a great family, then we put them in a high pedestal, not with God. Not with God. And so we see in God's calling of the Apostle Paul how he took this man who was a trained killer, a known assassin to the body of Christ. God even allowed him the freedom of orchestrating the killing of the first martyr. And I think it was the convert the, in the death of Stephen that the Holy Spirit began convicting the Apostle Paul. Never had they seen a martyr died like him. A man that was stoned to death when he should have been angry and screaming for pain. He prayed even in his closing moment a prayer of forgiveness for those that were stoning him. And then he prophesied, he declared, the Bible said in him being filled with his spirit, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he exclaimed, I beheld the heavens open, 
and I see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. And then he said, Lord, forgive them. And then he said, receive my spirit. And that man was gone. I think that never had I seen this. A man in the face of death stood bravely, stood without flinching, without crying for pain, being under the control of the spirit. Could you imagine that, you know, today when we say that a man is filled with the Holy Ghost, we when it calls us think of gifts. We think of being used mightily of God, and I believe it includes all of that. But a life that is brought under the control of the Spirit of God, even in the face of death itself, without any sense of dread, any sense of torment, any sense of pain. And he can even forgive the adversaries while he was being killed. I believe that's the sum total of what it is like to be really filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not our ability at the point of the manifestation of gifts. It's our ability to deal with trouble and difficulty when we are at our wit's end, when we are like the children of Israel, when we are facing a Red Sea experience. The true test of what you have on the inside is not at the point of your strength, is at the point of your weakness. And so we are seeing this evening and looking at the Apostle Paul, and if you look at all of his writings, you will see how he opened up those epistles. Paul is servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostello, called to be an apostle. That word apostello, a sent one. An apostle of whom? Not of men, but of Jesus Christ. And so the call of God is very vital in our lives. Called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, the servant of God. So this man was a called man, and everything that he got, we saw where he got it. I think we could do a quick reading, because I'm just doing an introduction to the Apostle Paul to us. We are reading, we, we are going in to, you should write it down. What are we going to study? Pauline theology. Why Pauline? The revelation that God gave to the Apostle Paul. And we are going to go through the whole New Testament. We're going to even go to the gospel. We have never done that. All my years in global, we have never done that. But we did the book of Revelation. We did the book of Daniel. And I'll be getting into the New Testament. But we are going at the revelation God gave to this man. And I believe of all the writers of the New Testament, none of them were given the depth of the revelation that Paul the Apostle got. I was even reading the Johannine writing, the writings of John, and he got a different slant of revelation. Peter, the picture, uh, writing, the writings of Peter, he got a different, another aspect of the revelation of the gospel. But it seemed as though that God had allowed the Apostle Paul a depth, a, a depth of insight that none of those original apostles had done. Why did he allow it? I cannot say. Can't say. Why did he not give it to Peter? Peter was with him from the very early stages. Why did he not give it to him? But you see, this is the idea. When it comes to the things of God, we have to be very careful. God is not like a man. So I want us to just do a quick reading. Let me make sure I have it um, line up here. Um, let me make sure I have the right scripture. I don't think it's this one. Or is it? 
nem akkor te vihet a húgat, hóra. Oké, so we, let, let's have the second Corinthians. And I want to read second Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 1. And we are going to take a reading because what I'm introducing to you, where the Apostle Paul got this revelation from. Where did he get it from? And um, this is the body of the teaching that came from the Apostle Paul. The nature of it, the depth of it. You see, some people can just read the surface. But when you get at the depth of it, it will, it's transformative. It's a transformative body of work that will take you to the depth of why Christ came. When we look at the other writings, we see Christ dying on the cross for our sins. That is global teaching in all of the writings of the, of the New Testament writings. But Paul went a step further. He talked not only were the God placed our sins on Christ, but in 2 Corinthians 6, he tells us that um, knowing this, that the old man was crucified. Not just our sins, but the old man, the old self was crucified that the body of sin might be destroyed, that hence we should not serve sin. And as there Paul got the, the, the truth from when he said in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. Not just my sins was on Christ, but the old man was also nailed on that cross. Anybody have an idea what that means? Anybody respond? What do you think that means? That the old man, not just our sins, but the old man was nailed on the cross as well. I never heard that from Peter or anybody else. And that is very unique to the, to the revelation God gives to Paul. Unique to that. And, and I want you to make a note of that verse of scripture, Romans chapter. We're going to come to that in our, in our teachings because that's the first book we're going to be studying from. But in Romans chapter 6, verse 5, Paul says, uh, knowing this that the old man, the old self, was crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that hence what we should not serve sin. Wasn't only our sins placed on Christ, but the old self, the old man, the old unregenerate man was nailed on that cross with Christ. And Paul was asking the question in chapter 6, shall, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead? And in the Greek, the word used there in the tense is in the aorist tense, meaning an act that has already happened. How shall we who died past tense to sin? Let me ask you a question. How many of us realize that the old man died on the cross of Christ. The old self, not just our sins, but the entire kaboot. God nailed that old man that was living in you before, doing all the evil, that was filled with that disease called hamatia. God took our sins and the old man himself and nailed it to the cross. And Paul was asking, oh, how oh, shall, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Or oh, shall we that died into sin? The past tense and are completed in the past is not going to happen. It happened at the same time Christ died. The old man, the old self, was had died with him on that cross. And Paul's argument was, we cannot continue in sin. Why? Because the old man was nailed to the cross. The old self, there was a death and a burial there. When Christ died, we died. When he suffered, we, he was nailing the old man on that cross with him. And Paul made it personal. 
he said in the book of Galatians, he said, I am crucified with Christ, he personalized it. Not just mankind, he made it personal. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ in liberty me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live it. How? By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we're going to come to that powerful book. I'm just giving you little nuggets. You will see that aspect of teaching nowhere else. As Paul has done it, you will see the widespread in all of Paul's writings. It, 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 Paul was asked the question, shall we continue in sin? That grace, some people believe the more you sin, the more grace you will get. So he said, Paul is saying it's impossible. He said, why? He said, because don't you know all of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You're going to come to that. We became united with Christ. We became joined with him on that cross. We were united with him when he became sin, with our sin. And at the same time, nailing the old self to the cross, he was bringing to an end the reign and the power of sin and the old man that once lived in your life. No other teacher taught it like that. And we're going to get into it in a very deep way. And my prayer is that God will take us into a full understanding of what Christ did in totality on that cross. Because the Lord told me back in 2018, he said, son, do you know the vast majority of my people do not have not fully grasped the entirety of the of the gospel message. We have not grasped it in depth. Many have skimmed the surface and have not gone into the depths of it. That on that cross, it wasn't just our sins were forgiven. Christ our Lord was in essence nailing to the cross self, the old man, sin, and everything that sin brought into the man into the into the human race, he was dealing with it on his cross. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help us to grasp this. Now, everybody, let's turn to first, second Corinthians. Where did Paul get this message from? Let's see where he got it from. Um Second Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 1. And I am going to read. I'm going, I see June is around, so I'm going to throw out the June as well. She would be able to uh, assist in reading from the different versions. Um, I'm seeing quite a few of our folk from our Bible study on Saturday here with us this evening. So I read all of you uh, on. Follow in, in my read, June. Could you position yourself? As yeah. well as uh, Pastor Stephen is here, so he would help us too. Let me begin by 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Right? To glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Do you notice what the first thing he said? It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory or to boast. I, do, I wonder how many of us realize that boasting is dangerous. When God gave you a gift and is using you in a particular way, you have to be very careful with pride. A lot of us, including this preacher first, know about that. Pride is a killer. Always remember the first sin that destroyed the devil was not any other sin but pride. You hear me? And today, many of us who are being used of God, that's why you have to pray for God's servants. Pray for those that God is raising up because the flesh is incapable of handling pride. Do you know that? Not even the devil handled pride well. His heart was lifted up in pride. Why? Because of his beauty. 
That's why it's when we begin to be used of God, we have to be more careful. It's not at the point of your weakness, you know, it's a point of your strength where you become very susceptible to engaging in that deadly sin of arrogance and pride. That's the truth. Hear what he says. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory or to boast. And then he went on to say, I will come to vision and revelations of the Lord. What is he going to say in verse 2? Do you want to take us in the reading there? In verse 2. Verse 2 says, in the living translation, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Verse 3. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know, verse 4, that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Think, in words, things no human is allowed to tell. Well, have you heard what, he, what he's saying there? That's a mouthful enough. You want to know where Paul, that's why I'm giving you the introduction. Paul didn't learn this in Hebrew school. He did not learn this at, in the University of Alexandria under the Greek Gamaliel. He's telling you how God had orchestrated this whole movement. And I, I want all of us to hear this evening. It's important for you to know you and your life is not a mistake. You think it's only the Apostle Paul? See, but he was, he was a great apostle. Let me tell you something. Even a janitor in the church is seen as great in the eyes of a holy God. You are being, God is not like human beings. It, it's not like a man. Every man runs in his own lane. Everyone. The janitor. The, uh, uh, who else? The, the usher in the church. Those who are involved in, in the security arm. Those who are involved in charitable works, all of us are called to service. The pastor, the fivefold ministry, who are called to maintain the church, to, to prepare the church for the work of ministry. And every aspect of the work of God, every one of us must know how serious it is. And that's why he kept, in all of his writing, he kept saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not of men. He said, I was not called of men. He was a killer. And God orchestrated the destiny of this man. And I want to say to all of us on this evening that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. You are not a mistake. You're not a mishap. No, you are a creature of design, purpose, and great destiny. And Paul is saying, I was caught up. In the King, in the King James, it says, verse 4, if I read it in the King, King James, he said, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. He said, I didn't know he couldn't tell whether he was in his body or out of his body. He said, I couldn't tell. And I want some of you all to know that. There are times the Holy Spirit will cause, in the case of Roland Bach, who was given the message on angels on assignment, he was in his study preparing for the Sunday morning sermon and was taken out. Taken out of, the, out of his body and went up. There are a lot of people who are taken out of their bodies. Lots of visions they're taken out of their bodies. Jesse Duplantis, his encounter when he was taken to heaven in 1988, I think, he said he couldn't tell whether he was in his body or out of his body. 
Paul couldn't tell. And there are those moments when the Holy Spirit will choose to do that. I have read of men who were in worship services and all of a sudden they were in the service and the next thing they entered into the dimension of heaven. Just like I just entered in. They were just born in there. When they look around, they were in heaven. They walked the streets of gold. Listen to me. We are living in some amazing times. But the Apostle Paul, it's very important that we understand what he's saying here and describing to us. He says, such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God know it. Verse 4, read with me. All that he was caught up. Where? Into paradise. God took him into the heavens. You heard some of my ex ex experiences of being taken into the presence of God. These are life transformational encounters. Your life will never be the same. When you have an encounter like that, you might go through all kinds of challenges, but it's one thing I could tell anybody. If you have had such encounters of God, your life will never ever be the same ever again. It impacts you on a level that no other experience in this world can, can uh, impact you. Your, it doesn't matter what the enemy pelts at you. People who walk through those experiences, these are the things that fold them up together. They know what they saw. Paul was caught up to the heavens. Hear what he says? And I heard unspeakable words. Do you know your version for it? How we describe it there? Verse, verse um, four. Four. It said that I was caught up to paradise and her things so astounding that it cannot be expressed in words. He things... saw things that, that was astounding, mm -hmm. astonishing, mind blowing. You know, some people. God cannot give every and everybody these encounters huh? because some people, when they get it, they are ill-prepared to handle it. That's why God has to prepare people at times before he gives them such exposure. I, I, some people were taken into the heavenies and when they saw what they saw, they didn't want to live after it. They didn't want to come back here. <laughs> they came back and they're complaining all the time. And that's why there are many people God cannot give those encounters. Because they will not be able to handle returning. Do you know what it is? Most people who died and came back from him, came back and saw the glimpse. Some of them never went into heaven, but they, in the tunnel of death, when they were coming through the tunnel, leaving earth to go into eternity, they ran into the, 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 the burning sunlight of God's presence. They saw the white light. Some people said it was as if you were wrapped in the blankets of pure love. Do you know how many people that one encounter changed them radically? I've, I've studied the report of the lives of many people who had those out-of-body experiences and when they came back, their lives were never ever the, the same. Never. And do you know the strange thing Stefan, that is why we were born for that. Man was born to have and to live in that divine life. It's called the abundant life. You know, the vast majority of the church, we have not gone in that depth, basking in the presence of this divine life. When you enter that field of divine life, you are being caress, blanketed with the divine energy of love. Undescribable. You heard my, my encounter when I got saved. Liquid, undescribable joy like a fountain began flowing, coming up like rivers as long as I live. i never forget that. Every time I say it, it blows my mind. 
You know, the devil don't want the church to reach at this point. He wants you to believe that what you feel and what you hear and all the hell you're going through and all the challenges you're going through, that is the sum total of it. And that is the reason why we're studying what we're studying. We're going to get a good look of what the abundant life really is and what it's not. And so we have to do that. Paul says in verse 4, he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. He said what he saw, he couldn't even talk about. He couldn't share with another human being. Do you know sometimes when you enter those dimensions and the Lord allow you to see certain things, he tell you, I don't want you to talk about this. You're not to share this. Paul said there's some things he saw he couldn't talk about. Couldn't talk. He saw things that blew his mind. And you know, God wants his people, he wants his church to know it's not when they get to heaven. We can begin on this dimension, living in this body, to begin to share in the depths of God's glory. That's why Paul said it to the, the church um, in, the, in the book of Colossians, if you then be risen with Christ, do you know we are already raised up with Christ? The spiritual dimension, we have not gone, gone in there in its depth. We are not taught that sufficiently to begin to live in that dimension. But I'll hold that back. Let's run. He says in verse 4, he said, it's not lawful for man even to utter. What I saw, I can't even talk about it. Could you imagine that? We saw what John saw in the book of Revelation. The great plan of the ages. That this old system will just pass away. We went through that when we studied the book of Revelation. All that we know, all that we have grown familiar with in this dimension, when Christ when at the end of the thousand years reign, God is going to cause everything just to pass away. And he'll create a new heaven, a new earth. We saw, we, we looked at the beauty that's coming for us and those that will serve the Lord. We looked at that. But even while we are living in this body, I want everybody to hear me here. You do not have to die to begin to experience the deeper things of God. Pastor, what are you saying? Well, why do you think the Bible says, eyes have not seen, no ears heard, neither has it entered into the heart of a man, the things which God had prepared for them that love him. But, the conjunction is, but God had revealed them unto us. How? By his spirit. For his spirit searcheth all things, even the deep things of God. Do you know the Holy Spirit right now, his job is to make these things known to you while you're living here? What do you think the abundant life is? Emotionalism? No! A believer who lives on this side of heaven, who has experienced redemption, the born-again experience, was designed because Paul said it in Ephesians. We were quickened together, meaning we had a life, raised up together. Do you know we were resurrected with Christ and made to sit together when we get to heaven, when we die? No. Here and now, we are alive spiritually while we live in this body. And the Holy Spirit's role, as we begin to teach you, is to cause your eyes to open. And you begin to develop a longing. The Holy Spirit that lives in you is not only here to make you feel good. His job is to reveal to you the deep things of God. Eyes have not seen, ears heard. Neither has it entered into the heart, the thinking of a man. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. The job of the Holy Ghost is not only to tickle you and make you feel blessed but to take you into your rich in 
inheritance while you're living in this, in this body. And many of you will begin to experience it. Many of you will begin, not, you don't have to die to experience it. And that is one of the teachings of the of the, of the apostolic teaching of Paul. God, but God had revealed him unto us by his spirit. Why? For his spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit has a university of divine education waiting to download in the heart of a believer who is willing to begin to feed deeply on the revelation of the teaching of God's word. That's where I'm heading. You, know, you don't have to wait for that. We can begin to live and enjoy that abundant life. The life of God. We are raised up together, Paul says. Seated together in the heavenly realm. You know, the vast majority of churches, that's not taught. The Lord told me that in 2018. He said, not even you understood it. I've, most of my people have not understood that my son paid a price for them to live an abundant life, not when they get to heaven on this side of heaven. And you are one of them who have not, un uh, who have not understood it properly. That is why I want you to study and to follow my instruction. Let's just run through this quickly. Verse 5 says, Paul continues, of such a one, he's referring to himself, Rather than say, I, Paul, saw this. He's so careful not to boast. The flesh is very dangerous. Boasting will kill you spiritually. Pride and arrogance in your heart is an enemy to any man who God will share the deep things with. Because this flesh is severely limited and does not have the ability to handle properly deep, the deep things of God. God has to help us. He said in verse 5, read with me, of such a one will I, uh, uh, of such and one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my, but in my infirmities. June, could you read that in, the, in your version, verse 5? It says, that experience is worth boasting about, but I am not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. You see what he says there? He said, listen to me. He said, it's easy to boast. It's easy to become braggadocious. It's easy, it's easy to become a boastful individual. When God begins to share the deeper things, this flesh is incapable in handling it. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. What God is about to reveal to us in this teaching is going to be revolutionary. It's going to be transformative. God doesn't want us to live on the surface. Christ did not only die for our sins. And that's the point I'm making. Paul is going deeper now. He was given insight, not for himself or for the body of Christ. June in verse 6, what it says. It says, if I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so. Because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it. Because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. In, in the King James, hear what Paul says in, in verse 6. For though I would desire to glory, you see the flesh loves glory. <laughs> Pastor Stevens, the flesh loves glory. We must know that. Question. Yes. Good. Good. I uh, when when one ha would have had that kind of experience, it it, it would um and you 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 tell of that experience. Some people might even try to treat you like deity, and and there where pride will take you over. Definitely. Definitely. You see, the issue with the flesh, the flesh is incapable, Pastor Stephen, to handle this kind of glory. Cannot do it. And Paul is admitting that to us. Look in verse 6. 
For though I would desire to glory, <laughs> is that like the flesh loves that? I shall not be a fool. <laughs> Paul is saying, I am not a fool to even to allow glory and boasting and braggadociousness to come into my life. Because do you know how many ministries, ministers, and saints that started off on the humble pathway and when God began to glory, use them. Just the flesh and the accolades and the praise and the adulation that comes from mankind. How many have ended up on the, on the dustbin in the, in the labas? How many lives were ruined when the flesh took them over? People pat them on the back. Everywhere they go, they have bodyguards. People put them on pedestrian. Paul said, I will not be a fool. A fool is anyone who allow God's blessings and God's gifts to make you feel you're more than you, are or you ought to be. He said, I will not be a fool. A foolish man of God, a bishop, an apostle, a prophet, call him whatever the name might be. Anyone who does not understand this, and keep it in mind, Satan did not commit what we call a big sin on this earth. His sin was what? Pride. The sin of an uplifted heart. Look at this now. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say to the, I will say the truth, but now I forbear, I restrain myself. Lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he should hear of me. You see, you see the great care, the concern that this apostle is telling us: watch pride, watch self. Sometimes some people look very humble on the outside. They talk in a humble way. People say, Oh, isn't he humble? Oh, humble she is. Don't allow an appearance to fool you. The Bible said, the heart of man, uh, uh, what, what how the Bible put it? The heart of man, no man could know. No one could know the heart. Some people may look humble. Others might be kind of braggadocious, but in their heart, their attitude is right. But Paul says, I refuse to boast. Verse 7, June 1 verse 7 says, uh, because verse 7, continue to from verse 6, I just want to yes. back up in verse 6 and come Go forward. Ahead. Do that, yes. Okay, so let me just read 6 and 7 together. If I wanted to boast, I will be no fool in doing so, because I will be telling the truth. But I won't do it, because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. And yes, 7, I'm continue. Yes, I'm that. Yes, go on. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Wow. <laughs> Anybody want to respond to that? Give me a response. Talk to me. God, no, you know, a, a lot of people talk about what was the torn and spoiled flesh. It is. I am curious. Go ahead. I'm listening. To Chris. Um, I'm, and I'm curious because I've, I've been having my experiences with the Lord, right? Yeah. And definitely I have gone through a very rigged, rigged process. Um, Lord taking me through different things, which to the point where I don't really feel like honor or worthy to experience the things that I've already experienced and the things that he's telling me that I will experience. Mm -hmm. Right? And and it's it's hard. And I'll say this, and I'm saying this from my experience. It's very hard because you want to share things with others, not from a, a point of 
being boastful or because right. you know right. but because you're just so excited all right like all right. oh my god this is what i experienced like how do you really manage because i think no matter what i do no matter what i do i just feel like people always take my um my experiences or the things that i share in the wrong manner and and that i i know that you always tell me not everything you share you know you you said that to me before and from since then i've kind of like held back from things that i i have experienced but how do you manage you know being in that in that place experiencing the things that god is allowing you to experience and not you know come off to somebody else that is not having that experience as if you're, you're you're being boastful or you're being prideful because you know this is what God has done in your life. You understand? How do you manage? Well, 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 first like, of uh, all, what? Mm -hmm. First of all, you you have no control over what people think of what you share. That's not your. You have no control on that. What you're responsible for, as Paul said, in what we read, there's nothing wrong in sharing what God has given you because. If Paul had not shared with us what God gave him, we would not have had it. But there are certain aspects of what he saw, God told him what he should not say. He said some things he couldn't talk about. There are a lot of things he saw, even Jesse the planters, when he was caught up to the heavens. There are some things he could not have shared at all. Later on, he, the Lord gave him permission to share a certain, more, a certain aspect of it. There are a lot of things you cannot share. Lots of what I experienced in the revelation department for years, I had not shared with many people, right? After many years, I felt released too. But the key thing is, and this is what you have to remember, to what God is going to, generally what he's giving you, you would know what you can share and what you cannot share. And you have no control over human beings. What they, people come to the conclusion, they want to put you on a pedestal, you have to be very careful with what you know inside of you. Pride, the absorbing sense of one's greatness, is what you have to be honest to God because you're going to feel it. You have to say, oh, God, help me. When you realize something is going on, you are the first person to know it. Others may not see it, but when it begins to become apparent in your own heart, that pride is seeking to take control. You have to be able to say, Lord, help me. I, let me use an example. Years ago, I, I, you know what? I was an evangelist for nine years. And the Lord used me greatly on the field. Pastoring is one thing. When I was on the field, it was a different experience. Right? And there are amazing things um, that I experienced in the field. I remember I was preaching in a large church in a big crusade in the South. Big cinema they were holding it in. As Prescott shared one week, Sherlock Bali, a powerful prophetic preacher, he preached the second week. And I was coming in the, in the final week. And the pastor of the church was introducing me. And the way he introduced me, all the things flowering things he heard about this man of God. And while he's talking, you see, this flesh is deceitful. That's the scripture. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who could know it. We don't even know ourselves. Let's face that. This flesh, your flesh, my flesh, we do not know what it's capable of. Hear me well. But in the moment he was going and talking, and he was very gracious to me. wasn't bad. But my flesh on the inside, I began to feel the swelling. And when I detested, detected it, I bowed my head right there on that platform. And I cried out to God. I said, oh, God, help me. Lord, help me. And I cried out to him. I said, Lord, everything I have is because you give it to me. I was nobody, nothing. I was a slow learner in school. Look where you're taking me now. I thank you. Help me, Lord. Help me. And you know, by the time I got on the platform, I didn't say, well, give God all. I said, thank you for your kind words. 
but I was able to say from my heart, everything that I have, everything I will ever get is because of the Lord. And when I said it, I knew it, for, it was from my heart. You have to be truthful to you. You have to be truthful to you. You're not responsible for what, how somebody else may respond to what you teach. But you're responsible for what is given to you. When the Holy Spirit is going to bear witness to your spirit when these things are happening inside of you. And when you get the revelation, you have to internalize it and you have to look within you with a searchlight of what is given to you and ask God's grace and help. Lord, help me to deal with this. Because this flesh cannot handle it. And when you're reading here what Paul is saying, he got all of this revelation. But God had to put a thorn in his flesh. Why? Because the flesh was incapable of handling it. This thorn in his flesh was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet or to beat. Do you know how that, how that is read in that version, in your version, what it says? It said that um, he was a, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Keep him from doing what? Becoming proud. Becoming proud. Pride who was a messenger? Who was a messenger from Satan? Well, 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 we do not know. And God had the reason why he did not allow us to know specifically what was the nature. With some people jumped to supposition. Some believe that it was an eye. Paul had an eye disease, a very bad eye disease, uh, where it was pus. Um, some people believe it was that because in one instance he told a church, he said, if it was possible, you'd have even taken out your eyes and give it to me. So some people are of the view it was a serious eye disease that he had. And God refused to heal it. How serious is God about pride? And I believe the reason why he's so serious is because he knew that is what brought Lucifer down. Great preachers, great entertainers, Great worship ministers became victims of their own success. Bastian. It's a message for all of us. Go ahead, Pastor Stevens. But yeah, in the midst of it, we know that God would have placed the thorn in his flesh so that he would not be lifted up in pride. Right. But but men, men and, and women today, some of them that have fallen, do you believe that even when that pride came in, that God would have been speaking to them? Of course. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth in us. A person must know it in his own heart because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and will bear witness with your heart. Pride, listen to me. You talk about sins of the flesh. Some people put sins of the flesh above everything. Luther didn't have any sins of the flesh, but some people said, well, he was a, he was a, a spirit. Why would he have problems? Well, you read the book of Genesis with those angels who came down and cohabited with women. Huh? They had children, and from there they had a giant a, 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 a group, species of giants that came out of that relationship. Pride is a killer. The heart of man is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who could know it? None of us could know what's in us. And the Lord saw that Paul had the tendency to be puffed up. And we're going to look at the text above measure, according to the King James. Not just puffed up, you know, but puffed up above measure because of the abundance of revelation God gave to him. And you'll see the reason why God, some of us are asking God for things and he's not allowing it because he knows. Some of us are incapable of handling it successful. The little praise, the little pat on the back, you hear the great comments, do you know who that man is? Every one of us on, beginning with this preacher, let me tell you something. This flesh, I have experienced things that many people have never experienced. 
have taken me in the realms of the spirit. I've seen things. I've experienced things that many folk have never had in conquest of in their lives. And let me tell you something. Their flesh will ruin it for you. Just the praise of men by itself. Just a pat on the back and how people would elevate you and lift you up. God says, Paul, I am not going to uh, look, read it. Um, 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 Junior, still on the reading there. Finish your reading of what it says there. Let me read it in the in the King James here. And, I, I, and this is what Paul says in verse 7. And least that I should be exalted above measure. Not just exalted, you know, above measure. The more you get is the more the propensity to become a victim and of your own success. The same way God is using you, you have to yield to him to strengthen you. That's why some preachers, when they're through preaching, they get away from people jumping the can go. Because people have a propensity to make a God out of you. The higher you go, is the greater the temptation, the money, the allurement, the praise, the accolades. This flesh can handle so much. You hear what it says? At least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. Underline that word. Through the what? abundance. Pastor Stephen, there are things that Paul never could have shared. He shared only what God told him to share, you know. <laughs> There's some things you can't share. And you would know what you can and cannot share. I'm giving you all an introduction. This is just an intro to Pauline, to our t teaching, our studies in Pauline theology. This man, a killer. That's why God chose him. One of the reasons why I believe God cho chose the Apostle Paul is because what God was going to download in him, he must not take any credit. He would know that he was the least of all the apostles to talk. God was saying, I took you out as a killer. And what you have here is totally mine. You didn't learn this from the University of Alexandria. You didn't learn this under the great Gamaliel. You got it from the realm of the spirit, the school of the Holy Ghost. Many of us, all God is looking for is a yielded vessel who is yielded to him in order for the spirit to download inside of that individual all that heaven has. There's nothing in this world that can be comparable to a life that is yielded, totally dependent on God. It's when you begin to smell your own self and you say, because I did all my studies and I, oh, I sat under these great teachers. Oh, listen to me. In one moment, the Holy Spirit can change your life. One moment, he can take you into dimensions that few people have ever been in. Believe me. And he says, I believe that one of the great challenges I experienced, God has a deal. I, I was a very powerful person. Here. I wouldn't, I didn't song that way, but I, I knew what I was dealing with. I believe I was impregnable. In my heart, at one time, I believe it was not possible for me to fall to anybody. And I told a friend of mine that, and the Lord rebuked me. I was dealing with that. Because of where I, what I saw, where I was taken, pride. You feel you're impregnable. You feel, I mean, you talk humble, but in your heart, I was powerful. I didn't know it was possible that I could have fallen to anybody. And it was about sex sins. I hated that. Telling you the truth. This flesh is a killer to the work of God. God begin to use you and the flesh get a hand on you, you are in trouble. Let's run on. Let me move. 
And it was given unto me, he says, a thorn in the flesh. What was the thorn in the flesh? The messenger of Satan to buffet me, to beat me. As I said, some people believe it was an eye disease he had that was running pus. I do not know that to be a fact. He was under a severe, whatever it was, the devil was behind it. God allowed him access. And the enemy used it. Hear what he says. Least that I should be exalted above measure. Why was it allowed? Because of the tendency to become proud, prideful above men. In verse 8, read with me, everybody. Read with me, verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord twice that it might depart from me. June, read that what it says in, in your version. It said in verse. Um, not eight. eight. Three times, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. And what was the response? Each time, verse nine, he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. <laughs> so now I am glad to boast about my weakness, weaknesses, so that the power of Christ can work through me. You see the revelation that God? He begged God three times, God, move it, please, move it. Oh, God, he passed, he prayed, crying out. God said, Paul, stop it, stop. I'm not going to move it. That I'm not going to move. But I'm going to give you the grace. Grace to handle that because you're going to learn in your weaknesses when you're strong. Ah, that's the revelation. Is when a man learns to be totally dependent on God. It's not just strength. Even the gifts given to you is a gift. <laughs> it's in your weakness. You learn to depend. You learn to lean. You know what pride is? The heart of a, the, uh, 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 the sin of an uplifted heart. When you think it's because of some gift or ability or some endowment that I have. Oh, look at me, look at me. No one is like me. God says, all right. Nobody is like you. I have a plan for you. I have something I have. Specially designed to deal with you, son. Because I know how you think. You see, God knows us here. He told the seven churches in the book of Revelation, I know your works. You can fool somebody, but God knows your heart. As a preacher. As a servant of God, let me tell you something. When I walk through what I walk through, it woke me up. This flesh is our biggest enemy. You know where your enemy is living? Not outside of you, you know. Your enemy is inner me. The inner me is the enemy within. The flesh that loves praise, glory, and adulation. Sometimes it sounds humble, but it's pride on the inside. You're boastful because of a gifting that God bestowed upon you, an ability that you have downloaded. And the Lord knows if I only use him to do anything further, that one act of my grace can be can spell his downfall because my son doesn't have the ability to handle it. We have heard of great preachers that God raised up and they became victims of their, the success of their ministry. Great singers, Christian singers, wonderful voices, and people made God out of them. The money alone, the mansions destroyed them. They started off like Saul, humble. And before Saul became successful. God had to take his hands off of him. He was no longer usable. God spoke to him and he began disobeying God. Pride and the flesh, like a runaway wild horse, was out of control. Many men, 
God had to withhold his hands from off of their life. And there's a message that this man of God, Paul, we're going to study the, the depth of revelation given to him. Things that he couldn't even talk about. And the flesh had a problem with it. And God says, I know how to deal with it, Paul. I have to use you. I can't take you home. There are times when God has to call people home. Because when the flesh jumps in, it will destroy you. It is a disease by itself. Remember the Herod in the book of Acts who gave a great speech and the people said, this is not the voice of a man. This is the voice of a God. What was the problem? Is that what the people said, you know? The problem was how he responded. How he responded. He accepted the praise. And the Bible said, because he did not give God the glory, an angel smote him and worms ate him up. That's New Testament. Remember old brother ne uh, Nebuchadnezzar? When he stood on the walking on the back battlements of the palace, looking the, at the beauty and the grandeur of Babylon, he said, oh, it's not an I, Nebuchadnezzar, build this kingdom for my glory and for my name. And while the words were coming out of his mouth, God took his sanity and God he, his fingernails grew like that of a bird's claw. They drove him out from the palace. He turned a madman. And God left him out there eating grass, grazing in the grass. The rain wet him. Sun dried him for seven years. God never forgot what pride did to Lucifer. Lucifer was brilliant. He was glorious. He was an anointed cherub until his heart was lifted up. Why? Because of his beauty. And let me tell you something. All of us here, let, learn this. Because we're going to get into the depth of this revelation. And I want to say to all of us tonight. I'm saying to all of us. We're, coming, we're going to close. We're, we're not going to go beyond 9 o'clock for you. God was saying to him. Saying to us. It's deadly. It's deadly. It is one sin that God is not going to mess with. Is the sin of an up, of the an uplifted heart. Pride. He cannot. Can he hold his hands over of a man because he would have to turn around and judge that man. Because he said, My glory will I not share with another. You will not share it. Do you hear what I'm telling you? God will not share his glory with another. And the more a man is yielded, pliable in God's hand, leaning on him for everything, is the more God could use a man. Why do you think John the beloved of all the 12 apostles lived the longest? He outlived all of the apostles. He's always leaning on the breast of Jesus. He, his relation, the Lord was more important to John than anything. And I believe one of the best ways we deal with pride is by totally yielding and falling in love. Not with the giver of the gifts. Not with the gifts, but the giver of the gifts. Loving him for who he is. Seeking him. Reading his word. Wanting to know. When I read the Bible these days, I want to learn more. I've been through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Looking at what John got. The revelation God gave him. And when I search now, because from 2018, the Lord began teaching me, Son, is my word, son. If you believe my word, if you feed yourself, the same way you eat three square meals a day, you feed your spirit with my truth and lean on it and declare it and establish it and walk in the light of it. He said, then I'm going to take you where I want to take you. Falling in love with him, allowing his word to become as food, as manna to your soul and your spirit. And let me finish this portion of the reading. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Look in verse 10. 
causes because of this now we realize now the dangers of boasting. He said, I take pleasure in infirmity, in weakness, because those things make me know that I am just an instrument. Everything I have was given to me. And there are times God has to break us, break the flesh. Why do you think so many people are asking God, Lord, use me, Lord, do this, and he's not doing it? Because the Lord knows we are not ready for it. Huh? Verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessity, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. I take pleasure in these things, in pressure, in persecution. For when I am weak, when I am weak, when I am weak, is then I'm strong. When I go through these things and I'm yielded to him, it's not my ability, it's his ability. All I have, all that I will ever have is because of him. And God could take a man that was yielded and broken like that and realize all that I have, all the great learning I gained among the Jews. Those things that were gained to me, I count them lost for the excellency of the knowledge that I found in Jesus Christ. We have to get a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. It's not that we, all those things. Am I in love with him? Do I know him? Am I pursuing him? A lot of us want the gifts, but we don't want too much to do with the giver of the gifts. We extol how greatly used we are, how majestic the anointing in my life is, and the giver is left in the background unrecognized. We love the gifts more than the giver because we get recognition and the applause of men. I'll pause at this point and I'll just, this is just the introduction. I have another aspect, part two, to share about Paul and I'm going to take you into another portion next week. What Paul did, where, where God took this guy, how God used him. How many of us want God to use us greatly, to trust us so he can use us? This flesh is our biggest enemy. Biggest enemy. I'll open the floor. Any questions before we close? Any statements? Anything? Um. You Pastor, Pastor Thompson, you speak a mouthful. Go ahead. You spoke a mouthful, and that is so true. Pride is, is really our biggest enemy. Amen. God yeah. Ready. Sister Susan, for you. Anyone else? Anyone else quickly? I think um as believers, I think all of us have been in that position where um you know God would have used you in some type of way that was visible to others, and you definitely would have felt that pride coming up. I don't know what well, let me talk for myself. I have felt that way before. And it it come. I don't know why. I don't know why it happens, but it just does. And it's almost as if it's a it's a type of self righteousness. It is. Um, and for me, uh, it's not something that you know you verbalize, but you feel so within yourself within the moment. And um. You know, I heard Kristen asking about, you know, how do you balance, you know, when the Holy Spirit using you and, and speaking to other persons. Um, I think the biggest thing is that remaining humble, remaining, you know, uh crying out to God in that moment and, and not only in that moment, but continuously. Continue. Because it really is so I don't know, I don't know, you know, when and and like I was telling myself, I say, like when you know I was experiencing 
experienced it. Um, there was a time we had youth week. This was some good years ago. And uh, I remember at the point in time, um, we had came home and God was moving really mightily within the youth week. And you were really seeing a lot of giftings and stuff being birthed and actually, you know, manifesting and, and more or less being established. Because persons would have had their gift then, would have, but now you're getting to see it in a pruned way. Yeah. And uh, I remember coming home, and when I came home, sis, he was like, when we came home, and I, I sat on the chair, and she was watching, and she, she said, Shelly, you know, your face shining. I'm like, for true, you find so, but as I said, the, the glory of God was really, really, you know, it was something else. And she said, no, your face literally shining. And I like to tell her, within that moment, I feel like, ooh, set up, oh God, I feel like Moses when he come up on the mountain, you know, he had to have that um veil over his face. And, you know, you really, really... You, you know, I kind of asking it a little bit, yeah. and I was like, Lord, I don't want to be feel. I don't want to feel better than. I want to be happy about what you are doing, but I must never feel better than. And like you know, I am the only one that God will. Yes. You know, the Lord is the Lord will use to say, "Thus said the Lord." So I think as a believer, as you said, the, the, we really don't understand how deceitful the flesh is. And I find that when you are being used by God in a mighty way, you get to see <laughs> that flesh rear its head, you know? So because now you, you, you're having that power that is manifested and you're being yeah. able to, you know, you're actually seeing that manifested power. Yeah. So you, you get to see the flesh um, act up a little more. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, um, as the word says, he must increase and I must decrease. So, you know, you constantly you have to be saying, Lord, you know what? I really don't want to be like this. You need to help me. And constantly crying out to him. Um and allowing him to do what he has to do. But yeah. as you said, I've heard you said this many times before, the anointing of God is something that a lot of us cannot control. Not control, yeah. but handle. Because yeah. the it is something it and I also heard you said over the years the anointing is something that attracts. Yes, it, so it, you know, going through that, going through that process with God, in in terms of allowing Him to to use you, and it is uh it is very, it is a a journey in which and a process in which you constantly have to be a based in Christ and yes, allow yes. Him to uh, listen. Paul and them fellas, that was good. Because you know, if the Lord said a show, it's certain things you're so excited about that. He looked God showing us, he's made a car, you know, over the seven seas and walk on the waters. You want to be so excited, but you know, God is awesome, and um, I will run with that and just cry out to God in that moment. But He is truly awesome, He's supernatural. There's no other God like our God, and I'm happy Amen. that we are learning more and more about Him. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? For me, one more minute tonight for you. My man. I want to say one more thing. <laughs> yes. As I was listening to uh, Shelly talk about um, her experience and how the, the flesh rises up. And that uh, you're absolutely correct. The flesh does rise up. And I think it, it, it rises and God allows it to rise. Because we have to be aware that it, it it is it is what it is. It's the nature of man, the sinful nature of man that is still a part of us. And it's also God showing us where we are. And also the Lord showing us um, how much of us that he has. And I will tell you why I'm saying that. Because there has been time in the past where I would feel 
oh wow look at how god used me to do that and and look how the person confirm what i was saying is true yeah even in the moment while it's happening you know that it's the holy spirit and the, that there is no glory to you right i mm -hmm. understand that but afterwards as you relay or you sit down and you think about how it happened and how the lord used you sometimes the 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 flesh rises up to to feel good about the moment and I remember recently, this was recently, in times past, it has, you know, rise up to, to feel like, you know, you, you feel like you, you, you're on cloud nine. You're like, you and God is besties and nobody else. But I recognize that that is really and truly a deception from the enemy. And recently, and I am saying, I'm sharing this because it's something that, I really didn't like because for years, and I mean years, the Lord has been telling me what I'm going to do with you is very public. It's not going to be something that is hidden. And I've actually literally ran from the idea, you know, like Jonah. Yes. Like, Lord, I don't want nobody to see me. Lord, I don't want to be out there. Lord, I don't like this. And it, it's like, no, I don't want this. I don't want this. My, you know, like you, you run mm -hmm. from the, the thought, you run from the idea and then eventually you're like you know lord i really want you to have your way in my life even if it's something i don't really want you understand i want you to get glory from my life because i realize the things that god has done for me where he has bought me from the things that he the way he died for me the way he gave himself for me understanding and having a revelation of that it's just so powerful knowing how yes. loved you are you're truly yes. loved like really really loved even in the nose even in the disappointments, that comes with love. It, it's yeah. not coming from, I just want to hurt your feelings. No, it's coming from, honey, darling, my son, my daughter, you can't have this right now because I know it will destroy you. Sure. I know that it will it, it will cause you to, to not serve me. I know. That is why you're getting a no right now. And, and let me tell you, I'll tell you recently, when that flesh rose up, when after I accepted what God was telling me he wanted to do in my life. Yeah. And that flesh rose up. I there was this sorrow that filled my heart. And I'm not kidding. Because I say, Lord, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that. That feel like, you know, oh God using me. And ooh, everybody singing your praises. Even when people tell me, you know, wonderful things now, it's like, I don't even want that. I don't, I don't want it because I know I don't deserve it. I know it's not even me. It's not even me. Yes. It's the spirit of the Lord that's in me. <laughs> Using this vessel in the manner in which he's allowed to because I give him full access. Yes. You understand? So that sorrow filled my heart. And you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? He said, Kristen, if you follow me, just keep following me. That's all. Just stay close to me. And that's why I'm like, you know, I'm determined to be a child yes. in his presence. Because a child don't really ask too much questions. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself because sometimes I just want to ask a million questions. Right? A child follows and trusts no matter what. Lord, it didn't go any way you say it was supposed to go. But I still trust you because I know Whatever you're doing is for my good. You understand? Whatever, wherever you're carrying me, I know that only good could come from it. I, I know that only your promises can break forth in this area because you said it. You understand? Yeah. Like even last week to now. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself this week. And I'm saying, boy, son, the Lord just ministered to me in such a mighty way. And he keep confirming to me over and over and over and over and over. Now is the time. It is here. I'm about to break forth. I'm about to do this. Bah, bah, bah. And it's like you ain't seen nothing. So you're expecting and you're excited. It's like this excitement in my spirit. Boom, Sunday night, I start to feel sick. Monday, I ain't go to work. Tuesday, I ain't go to work. Well, today, I'm usually off on a Wednesday. And I say, Lord, I ain't feeling good. I say, Lord, what part of the plan is this? <laughs> I just laugh it. At myself, what kind? What part of the plan is this, Lord? 
you know, and then the Lord just reminded me, okay, remember, I told you I wanted it to, to get certain things in order, work on those things, work on those things, you know, and it's like a real just having to trust God in the midst of everything and just really denying yourself. Yes. And I love that I don't have to do it by myself, that he's not somewhere far away, you know, that when I feel that or when I, I, I sense that self want to take control or self want to be in charge in whatever way, words, thoughts, and in deeds, that I can call on the Holy Spirit and I can exact whatever it is, deal with it using the word of God because that's something he told, keep showing me it's so powerful. You understand? You yeah. deal with it. I have given you the power. And whatever I can handle, Holy Spirit step in. You know, so your, your salvation is not, it's not boring. Some people be like, Christianity is boring because you don't know the God of the believer. It's not boring. It's not boring. Even in the rough times, there is still joy. Yeah. There is still peace. There is still laughter. Even in your darkest moments, yeah. God has always given me some kind of humor. I'm like, Lord, what? You are just so... I'd be like, Lord, you're really ridiculous. You know, look at what you showed me. And I laugh and kill myself laughing. And I go into the most horrible time. You understand? But he knows just what to do. So just staying connected to him, cultivating that relationship with him is the most is the most wonderful thing you can do in all your life. More than going to work, more than making money. You understand? Having that peace with him and that relationship with him is everything. Is everything. And you can have it at any moment, at any time, any day. God is there. You know, just acknowledging him at all times. Making him know that you're aware. You know, that your body is his temple. It's just, for me, it's very, very exciting. Amen. Exciting. All stop. right. Thank you so much. Well, I want to say to all of you, we are on a very dramatic journey in the studying of the odyssey of the revelation that God gave to the Apostle Paul. I'll give a little more intro, intro of him next week. And the, the week after, we are going to go right into the exegesis of beginning first with the first book, Romans. And we're going to go to a powerful book. I'm going to give you the outline. Everybody will be given an outline so you'll be able to Work along with that. Okay? Let's bow our hearts in prayer. I'm going to ask. Let me turn over to Pastor Stevens. Pastor Stevens, you take over and give it. I'll just give the announcement, Pastor.